In the last lesson, we looked at the relationship between concentration and colligative properties of solutions. These are properties whose value depends solely on the concentration of solute particles in the solution. Occasionally, though, we do see larger changes in these colligative properties for some solutions than we expect based on the concentration. Let's look at an example. Which of the following solutions would you expect to have the highest boiling point? A 1.0 molal sucrose solution, a 1.0 molal potassium chloride solution, or a 1.0 molal, molal calcium chloride solution? To answer this question, we must first consider the boiling point elevation formula. Notice that boiling point elevation, delta T, is dependent only on two factors, the molality of the solution and the boiling point elevation constant. And since all the solutions have water as their solvent, that means they all have the same boiling point constant, 0.52 degrees Celsius per unit molal. They also all have the same molality. If both concentration and boiling point constant are the same for each solution, then we would expect all of these to have the same elevation and boiling point above 100 degrees Celsius. But when we measure this in a laboratory, we see something completely different. It turns out that only sucrose has the boiling point elevation we expect. Potassium chloride has nearly twice the boiling point expected, while calcium chloride has nearly three times that expected. So why do calcium chloride and potassium chloride have such anomalously high boiling points while sucrose behaves the way we expect? The answer is that potassium chloride and calcium chloride are electrolytes. They're soluble ionic compounds, and how they dissolve is actually significantly different than the non-electrolyte molecular compound sucrose. Let's look at potassium chloride as an example. It's made up of two different types of ions, positively charged potassium and negatively charged chloride. In solid form, these ions form a crystal lattice with many formula units layered together, and each formula unit consists of one potassium and one chloride ion. Now, when the solid dissolves in water, the ions dissociate into separate particles. And what this means is that for every one formula unit of the electrolyte that dissolves, we form two particles for the dissociated ions of potassium and chloride. As a result, we actually have a solution of potassium chloride that has essentially twice the number of particles that we'd expect from the number of formula units. And molality is based upon number of formula units. So we essentially have twice the concentration that we would expect. So forming twice the number of particles means that we have about two times the elevation of boiling point. And if one formula unit of potassium chloride separates into two particles, then one formula unit of calcium chloride, CaCl2, separates into three particles, one of calcium and two of chloride ions. So this means the solution of calcium chloride essentially has three times the effect on colligative properties. In contrast, non-electrolytes are molecular compounds, and molecular compounds do not dissociate in general. As a result, non-electrolytes form only one particle for each molecular unit dissolved, and they behave exactly as we would expect according to our colligative property calculations. So they behave exactly as we would expect based upon their calculated molality. Ethanol is a great example of a non-electrolyte, the molecule of ethanol doesn't dissociate into separate charged ions. As a result, it's not capable of carrying a current, and that's where the name electrolyte and non-electrolyte came from. 
electrolytes must be capable of dissociating into charged ions in solution. That's how they carry a current. Generally, that means that electrolytes can be recognized as soluble ionic compounds or acids and bases. To deal with the dissociation of ions in solution, we need to use a modified version of the colligative properties formulas when dealing with electrolyte or ionic solutes. To each of these formulas, we add one more variable, I, known as a Van t Hoff factor. The Van t Hoff factor is simply the ratio of moles of particles in solution over the moles of the formula units dissolved. For any electrolyte, this will be a value greater than 1 because the formula unit dissociates into multiple ions. It's important to note that measured Van t Hoff factors are often less than you would expect based on the formula for the ionic compound. For example, you would expect potassium chloride to have a Van t Hoff factor of 2 since one formula unit dissociates into two separate ions. When we measure the Van t Hoff factor in the laboratory, though, we see that it's usually less than 2. This is because of ion pairing. When two oppositely charged ions come near each other in solution, occasionally they do pair up and act more as a single unit than as two separate particles. As a result, dissociation is not complete in reality. At any moment in solution, some cations pair with anions, and the number of particles in solution is considered slightly less than expected. The ion pairing effect increases with concentration. The more ions in solution, the more of them that will be able to approach each other and pair. As a result, Van t Hoff factors are usually measured and specific to the concentration of the solution. For example, those that are presented in this table are specific for a 0.05 molal solution. Let's calculate the Van t Hoff factor from the measurement of the freezing point of a 0 0.050 molal calcium chloride solution. We're given the molality of the solution, the freezing point, and the freezing point depression constant for water. We're asked to solve for I, the Van t Hoff factor. Let's start with the modified freezing point depression formula for an electrolyte solution. Delta Tf equals the Van t Hoff factor I times molality times the freezing point depression constant. We're solving for I, so let's go ahead and rearrange the formula to have I by itself. We do need to calculate delta Tf first, the change in freezing point. The normal freezing point of pure water is 0 degrees Celsius. We subtract our solution freezing point from this to get a positive 0 0.27 degrees Celsius for, for our change in freezing point. We substitute this value into our rearranged formula along with the molality and the freezing point depression constant, and we find that the measured Van t Hoff factor is 2.9. Based upon the formula calcium chloride, we might expect I to equal 3, but we can see that in reality, ion pairing has reduced the number of effective particles in solution at this concentration. Incorporating a Van t Hoff factor into our calculation for vapor pressure lowering is a little different than the other colligative property formulas. The Van t Hoff factor has to be included in the denominator of the mole fraction because this is the only place that the number of solute particles appears in the concentration used. So let's calculate the vapor pressure lowering for a solution of the electrolyte calcium nitrate. We're given the moles of both our solute and solvent water. We're also told the vapor pressure of pure water at this temperature and told to assume an ideal Van t Hoff factor. This is the formula for vapor pressure lowering that incorporates the Van t Hoff factor. 
The lowercase n stands for moles of solute or solvent. To use this formula, first we must figure out what our ideal Van t Hoff factor should be. We'll use the formula of calcium nitrate as the key. If calcium nitrate dissociates, it separates into one calcium ion and two nitrates. This is a total of three ions from one formula unit. So we'll assume an ideal Van t Hoff factor of three. We'll substitute that into the mole fraction portion of the vapor pressure lowering formula to get a mole fraction for water of 0 0.7518. This is significantly lower than it would have been for a non-electrolyte solution with a Van t Hoff factor of one. We substitute this lower mole fraction into the vapor pressure lowering solution, and we see that the vapor pressure of the solution is 88.8 torr, much lower than the vapor pressure of pure water. To summarize, Electrolyte solutions always show a greater change in colligative properties than you would expect based upon the concentration alone. This is because electrolytes dissociate into multiple ions when they dissolve. To account for this, our colligative property formulas must incorporate into them the Van t Hoff factor, I, which is sim simply a ratio of the moles of particles in solution divided by the moles of formula units dissolved. For an electrolyte that forms multiple ions when it dissolves, I is always greater than 1. An ideal Van t Hoff factor is based upon the formula for the electrolyte and shows the ideal number of ions that would form when that formula unit breaks apart. In reality, when an electrolyte dissolves, some of the ions do pair together, meaning that the moles of particles that act in a solution are always a little bit less than the actual uh, number of ions that you would expect based upon the formula unit alone. As a result, the real Van t Hoff factor is usually a little bit less than the ideal Van t Hoff factor. For a non-electrolyte solution, the number of particles formed in solution equals the number of particles that were actually dissolved. As a result, the Van t Hoff factor for a non-electrolyte is always 1.